Now we were talking about that tree, which is later explained, of course, as the tree of life. Now we're on the, uh, just at that point on the, uh, have it here, yes. The 14th verse of the 8th chapter, when he starts talking about the tree, and we were just pointing out that here you have, here you have, uh, catch it, yes. The Mount Mary main shrine of the ancient synagogue at Dury Europus, the oldest Jewish remains in the world. And right above it is the, uh, the tree of life. And it has, it has Orpheus striking his lyre, bringing harmony into all things. It's the love of God. You see, this represents that. And the animals and the birds are in the tree, and all are being fed from the fruit thereof. We'll refer to that later. He goes on and talks about it here. <coughs> and notice the things. And a little way off, he looked whence they came, his sister, by the river of water, beheld the river of water. and. And I looked, and behold, a, the head thereof a little way off, and at the head thereof I beheld my mother, Sariah, and Sam, and Nephi, and they didn't know where they should go. Now, we showed this before. Here's a typical case of a, a river of water coming out of nowhere in the desert, and of course, the inevitable tree is growing there. You always find that, you see. Uh, the springs come out miraculously, of course, aquifers and so forth, and needless to say, they're greatly appreciated because they save your life, and there are very few of them, and when they empty, Enter the empty quarter, there are none, the largest desert in the world that they crossed during their eight years. Now that was torn. They described what they had to go through. But here's this typical stream of water with the, with the uh, a fountain, the head thereof, the fountain. We see the word ras uh, is the word for spring and head in Arabic. It's the word for head and the word for spring too. And uh, like ayin, an eye, that's where the, the stream originates. So when he says the head thereof, he's using the proper, he's using the proper idiom to explain, uh, to explain to designate the head, the beginning of the spring. So I would have left my pencil Now, and they didn't know where they should go. Now, this idea of the theme of the crossroads, it's classic in literature, as you know. The, the two ways. Uh, you will have your pearls of great price. Notice in the, in the round hypocephalus, at the bottom are two lines designated 16 and 17. Now, shouldn't I have brought this along? Yes, I should have, but I'm not going to get off the track too far. And if you have it there, those two lines, recently Goethe has written a very good study on that. And what, it, what he says now, you reach the bottom. When you reach down here at the bottom, you see the top and the bottom, this represents not only the underworld, this represents the place of turning, where you change your course. And three times it's mentioned, don't tehi there. Don't lose your way. Don't choose the wrong way. Tehi, as uh, Goethe has shown, means to take the wrong course and lose your way. When you get down here, this is the lowest course, and you're about to you're about to go up again. But don't start up on the wrong course. So nen tehi is the expression that's used twice there. The nen don't ever be sure not to do that. Very emphatic. See, don't take the wrong course. But this is a common thing. The story of Heracles at the crossroads from Xenophon and so forth. And true Thomas of Erkeldoon in the 12th century, he went to the other world, and they show him, see ye not yon broad fair road that's winding over yon lily leaving. That is the way of wickedness, though some say it's the road to heaven, and see, and see ye not yon narrow road so thick beset by uh, thorns and byres, yes. That is the road of righteousness, though after it but few aspires. He show, he's been, this is a true Thomas, he's called true Thomas because he had a vision and he, was, he never lied, so people saw he must have been taken away. And in this vision, he saw the true road, you see, the road of dalliance and the road of wickedness, uh, of righteousness together. But this theme of the true, true road you find all the time. Of course, where Heracles is at the road, the one of them is a fair dame beckoning him on, and the other road is a dame with a very stern countenance, Dame Virtue. And of course, the Dame Virtue, that's the road he's supposed to follow. <laughs> this is the stock feed in ancient literature and so forth, following the right road. Remember, as we said before, Dandy starts out saying, uh, in the midst of this black forest, I discovered my, I had lost my way, until his guide appears, who is the angel Virgil, uh, who was not an angel, who is <coughs> the writer who wrote about the gate of horn, the gate of uh, ivory, and so forth. So he beckons to them and tells them, this is the way, this is the way, come over here, and they did, and telling them that they should partake of the fruit which was desirable above all fruit, and Laman and Lemuel, he wanted them to come too, but nothing doing, they wouldn't do it. Now he beholds the rod of iron, the famous rod of iron in the 19th, in the eighth, 19th verse of the 8th chapter here. What is the rod of iron? It's along the bank of the river. Well, it's along the bank of the river. It's something to hold on to so he won't 
fall in. Now, there is a, a, a statement in the Midrash about, it says, when the Temple Mountain in Jerusalem, remember, it's been flattened off artificially to make place for the Dome of the, of the Rock and so forth that, that stands there today, the, the great mosque of the Muslims. And uh, before then, it was a steep rock. It was really quite steep where the, the Temple was originally built in the time of David and in the Jebusite city. And, and there were the the way, the sacred way that went up to the temple, you can see it in Athens uh, in the Acropolis, it goes zigzag, zag, steep and narrow going up the side, you know. Uh, the sacred ways always go up that way. It was slippery and it was on the rock, and when there was storm or rain, uh, you could fall off with your old feeble people and so forth. So there was a railing, went up to follow it. The same thing, and uh, what happened, you see, it uh, was iron and it rotted away in time and it was replaced, a wooden railing. But the uh, so you had to cling to the, to the iron rod to get up to the temple so it wouldn't slip and fall on the rock. The same thing, a notable example, is at Ceylon, at Adam's Mount. Adam's Mount in Ceylon, remember the sacredest place in the east? That's where Adam is supposed to have landed when he descended from the other world and came here. And there's a footprint there and so forth. And there, from there he went wandering and hunting for Eve and didn't find her until he got to, until he got to Medina. But when he got to Mecca, he made a, he made an imitation of the of the temple, the original temple that Adam built, and he an angel came and directed him, angel Gabriel, and showed him how to build it out of sheets of light and so forth. But here we have this sacred uh, this sacred rock, and going up to it was a a chain that people pulled themselves by. It was a, a brass chain going up, but it rotted away too, and it's been replaced. It's still there, been replaced by pieces of cable and, well, no, a chain. It was originally a railing that went up there. That's right. Uh, it's like the ship of Theseus on the Acropolis. Same one was replaced bit by bit as it rotted away. But uh, you can see pictures in the geographic and so forth of people pulling themselves up by that. Sometimes it's a chain, sometimes it's a rope, sometimes it's a cable. Anything can get to make it so that you can pull yourself up to the top. It's an omphalus is what it is. Every ancient temple, every ancient world shrine had an omphalus, which means an umbilicus, which represented the center of the world, the birthplace of, of the creation, so for the point of creation. So you pull yourself up to the top of the mountain of Adam's Mount uh, in Ceylon or Sri Lanka by means of this uh, hand railing, which has been replaced, as I say, as it's rotted away over thousands of years by various things. So this idea of pulling yourself and holding to the rod, it's a, it's a very common one, actually. And the, also the idea of, notice here, uh, and I behold a straight and narrow path, and see ye not yon straight, uh, yon narrow path, so thick beset with, with briars and thorns, yes. Uh, the thorns and briars, yeah, that's the way they, but few aspires. True Thomas sat on Furley, uh, by Furley Bank. A Furley he beheld with his e. He he was a, he fell asleep on Furley Bank, and beheld a vision. You see, well the same story is told about Pierce Plowman in English. You know, in Middle English you always take Pierce Plowman, a poem from the 11th century. Pierce Plowman in a summer season, as soft as the sun, as shrewd be and shrewd as I ask. He goes out forth as a pilgrim, and he falls asleep by the brook. Uh, by Malvern, by Malvern Brook. Uh, and he says, uh, And as I lay and lay in it, and looked in the water, I was laying and leaned and looked in the water, it swayed me slaving, it slaved so merry, I slept, I swift me, I fell asleep, it, it, it flowed so merrily. And then he, again, he has the vision of the two well, the, the two ways to go. Uh, and he's given the choice of the two of the two ladies in which way else you. So these things, this is very common. But the idea of being lost and wandered, because we're, we are lost in this world, you see, we are. And so you have the great Amduit, which is written only in the tombs of the greatest kings in Egypt, is the Amduit, the way to find the way. And you're conducted, it's, it's, it's quite a document, it's an amazing thing. And the Book of Gates, for more common people, and the Book of Breathings, the most important document in the Joseph Smith papyri that we have. Uh, so far. That's a guide. That's a handbook and a guide and a map to the other world to show you the way you should go, the right way. And there's the Stundenbacher, and, and there's in the tomb of Ramses II, the, uh, sixth and so forth, third. There are these elaborate maps and routes to show how you're to go in the other world and which ways you're supposed to take and which you're not supposed to take the guide. A handbook is necessary. The sense and scroll was that. And of course, they have the Liahona here and the divination arrows, and you hold firm to the divining rod if you're supposed to be led to something. I mean, the idea that we're lost and we need something to hold to is very important. 
foundation, the various images used for this. But see, this is sort of an allegory, and he's going to explain it later on. So the straight and narrow pass, and then the large and spacious building as if it had been a world. And uh, everybody striving toward that. Uh, large and spacious field, first the field, the Maidan, as if it had been, we men mentioned the Maidan before. That's a Persian word, but it goes back everywhere to the idea of Maidan, where the fortunes of men are settled in the world. Every battlefield, every uh, field of justing, you see, is a Maidan, where you settle the affairs of the human race. You come together in council as the great assembly. It's described in the beginning of the Book of Abraham, the, the, the hill of Olishem uh, by the plain, where they all met for the sacrifice and so forth uh, of Abraham. And there arose a mist of darkness. These mists of darkness, Dotty tells us, are very common and terrifying. It's funny, the desert isn't the place where you'd expect to find a, a mist of darkness, but you do if you find the proper, if you, well, a good example, of course, is the desertest desert in the world. I said the, the Rubel Kali, but equally desolate is the coast of Peru. Some of missionaries may know. The coast of Peru that gets no water at all, and yet it gets heavy mists. It's, it's drenched in these heavy mists all the time. Uh, that dr a mixture of dust and fog that come in from the sea, yet not a drop of water. It's a terrifying thing. And this phenomenon has been described by, <coughs> uh, by Cheeseman and by, uh, by others. Um, who is it? I mean, uh, Julius Oiting. He, w he, he described it very well. There are others, they all described this, Mr. Brown. This came and they get lost in it, insomuch that they did lose their way and they wandered off and were lost. That's the theme of the first psalm, isn't it? The, uh, the righteous man I mentioned before is like a tree planted by a pool of water whose, which bears fruit in its time and its leaves never fall off. Lo chain harish but that is not so with the wicked. Ki im kamutz asherited penu ruch, who is like dry, shriveled up vegetation that the wind blows away, puffs away. And then it says, well, you, at the end it says, yodea chadonai derech, uh, uh, it's uh, tzadikim, of course. You're there, there. God knows the way of the righteous. And the way of the wicked shall perish. And abadat means to get lost in the sand. To, uh, I mean, when with, with Professor Popper, who was an Arabist, but uh, I had Hebrew from him. I was his only student in this particular class. It was long ago in Berkeley. When you can imagine what one man was teaching all the Arabic and all the Hebrew at Berkeley, when I took him as his only student. Today, there are at least 40 people teaching each language. So that gives you how the world has changed since my day. And those were exotic languages nobody paid any attention to. But anyway, Derek Rishagim Tove means the way of the wicked shall get lost in the sand. Tove, Abada, that means to wander and get lost, not know where you're going. And that's what happens. And that's what he's talking about. Did lose their way and wandered and were lost. Derek Rishagim. I think the word Derek is interesting too. Derek. That's the Hebrew, uh, that's the Arabic tariq, Hebrew That's our word track and trace and trek and trudge and drag. So many ancient Egyptian and Semitic words are related to English that you will find are not shared with any other language, just with English. It's a strange thing. English is an archaic language, you see, that we speak. It's, it's a very interesting thing. Monosyllabic, remember, all, almost everything we say is just one syllable words. And no other language is worn down that far. We have no more case endings. We, we ignore them completely. We don't. And we have, we don't even uh, pay any attention to declensions. He said it to my wife and I. You couldn't use worse English than that, but everybody says it. I mean, you'll hear that sort of thing. Uh, it's horrible. But we're not even going to bother to say me anymore. We don't decline things anymore. But anyway, it's, it's interesting here. The, the way of the wicked shall perish, and it does here. They lose their way. And then... The others came and caught forth of the rod of iron and did press forward through the mist of darkness. They had to have a support, something to guide them. It guides them and it supports them at the same time, you see. It tells you where to go. Clinging to the rod of iron until they came forth to partake of the root of the tree. We're told that it rotted away as iron will rust and it was replaced by a wooden railing uh, later on. And then, cast my eyes on the other side of the river and here was the great and spacious building. And what a picture. As it stood in the air, high above the earth, and the top floors were filled with people partying, both young and old, it was a high rise, both young and old, and their manner of dress was exceeding fine, and they were in the attitude of mocking and pointing their fingers toward those. Now, well, no, it wasn't discovered till the 1920s with Shibam and other such places in Arabia. I was able to dig up an old geographic that will show you what, they, what, what we're talking about here. 
They really, really so. They go back to Babylonian times. Now here, with all the space in the world, why would people shoot up and 10 and 12 story skyscrapers? These are ancient, see? So get a good view of it from there, I'm sure. Well, as good a view as the pilot did here. <laughs> Rearing out, this is the skyscrapers of Sheba, many of them centuries old, hark back to the power of the Hadramaut kingdom. And here they are. These are still occupied, but you know, all along the outside here, the, they don't be, the windows don't begin until at least 20 or 30 feet above the ground for safety, so they can't be raided. But they're high in the air, and that's where, at night, if it's lit, that's what you see, a great and spacious building shining in the air. We have some other examples here. I mean, with real estate so cheap, with nothing but sand around there, why would they do that? Well, they're clinging together in a desert. See here, just a, just a few date palms grow here, and this is where the city of Shabam, but it wouldn't be there if it wasn't a trading center. It's on the caravan routes, the Hadramaut, the, the incense route. In Europe, you see, you had to burn uh, frankincense in the churches, and so there was this unfailing market. There was only one place to get it, and that was southern Arabia. That, that's the only place it grew in the world. So they had this monopoly and grew very rich. Here they are traveling along with their junk. Let me see now. Uh, here's a, a more modern city. But this isn't more like it. The towers, see their, their idea to shoot up into the air, to go high up into the air. But here is an ancient city. It's a ghost town now. But these, these go way, way back. See, it's on a mound that goes clear back to uh, three, uh, 3, 2000, 3000 BC. It's on the mound. But all these great towering houses you can see so clearly, they're all deserted today. And yet they are these, these high houses, these great and spacious buildings rising high into the air and uh, full of important people. This is where they live in the top, of course. That's where it's cool, that's where it's breezy, and that's where it's safe. But you notice the windows all begin high above the ground. And so when, it, when they're lit at night with their oil lamps, you uh, have the idea, of course, that, you're, that they're soaring, as it were, in the air, as he says here. Great and spacious, and it stood, as it were, in the air high above the earth. Well, these windows stand, as it were, in the air high above the earth. They're not really suspended, but they are high above the earth, and they look as if they were, of course, by night. And uh, they were having a party, and exceeding fine dresses and all the rest. And uh, after they had tasted the fruit, and they were making fun at the people down. That wasn't a thing to do, but they're always doing that, the people in the city. Remember, they call them the Baital Shah. No, I've lost my pen. Oh, here it is. Boy, I'm in a bad way right now. After Sunday, I'm not fit to be shot. Eh? All those meetings, all those talkings, all those classes and so forth. Gee. <laughs> Day of rest, they call it. <laughs> it is to laugh. Uh, well, anyway. And, of course, our people felt bedraggled and they were ashamed of that. And so, but that's true, they do. The, the di distinction between the Baita Shahar and uh, the vital Hajar is very great, the people that live in the houses of stone, the people that live in the desert. And they look upon the people who live in the desert as uh, people here, as <coughs> people in the West looked upon the Indians very much. There were Bedouins, there were wanderers living on the face of the earth, picking up what they could and so forth. So they make fun of them here, and they were ashamed of that. And they wandered off. They didn't want to be mocked anymore, so they just wandered off and were lost. Well, behold, to be short in writing, very interesting, to be short in writing, he saw other multitudes pressing forward. They caught hold of the end of the rod of iron and pressed their way forward continually, holding fast to the rod of iron. And they reached the fruit and fell down and partook of the fruit of the tree. But other multitudes, here the two ways, were, were tending toward the great and spacious building. And they came and couldn't cross the water, and they were drowned in the depths of the fountain. And many were lost to view, wandering in strange roads. Oh, that's another thing. When I got these, I would have had to spend at least 10 years in the pen if I had revealed any of them, because these were secret photographs made for an oil line across Arabia. My uncle Preston, my cousin Preston, being the chief engineer of the American Arabian at that time, he sent me these, but he said, whatever you do, don't tell anybody about it or anything like that. Now, this is the sort of terrain they had. We can pass them around. How easily you could get lost among, among these things and wander around. Well, if you've been in the Mojave, you know that's easy enough. Or here. Uh, my father used to have a big share in the elephant and eagle mine at Mojave. It was a very rich mine out there. But going out there, you could, if you got lost, they said, well, we won't go look for you. And here are these. Uh, there is a river of sand, not a river of water. But know the heat and the oppression is terrible. I say they were looking for the, the route. These were, these were all taken east, uh, 
just east of the Red Sea there, going across Arabia, taking the shortest route they could find. You notice it's a military plane they're using, the rascals. And here it's utterly, utterly hopeless terrain to follow. Well, we pass these around, postcards to send home, eh? <laughs> Having a fine time. Wish you were here. <laughs> you, you'd be you'd be dead if you were. <laughs> now, here is the main drags that tells us the pass through the mountains east of Aqaba, following the road to Ma'an. Ma'an was the only city up there. It was another of these trading centers. It was one of these tall cities here. That's the only way you could get through. And sometimes it's flooded and you can't get through at all. And here is an example of of the more fertile, following the more fertile places of the wilderness, where you have these under, underground aquifers and so forth, where it has rained 10 years before and there's still groundwater, so you find something. It's like the Denemato wash, the sole support of the Hopis down there. Without that wash, they wouldn't get anything. But these run, we are told, for hundreds of miles sometime, right across the continent of Arabia. It's a vast thing, you see. Half the size of the United States, <laughs> nothing in it. And here they are crossing going along, and the thing is they have their tents. They have their tents on their camels there. They make big bundles, of course, but, uh, and here they are crossing the terrible uh, Urkut at Dahaya, 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 of, of desolation. And it is utterly desolate, you see. They have, it took them eight years to cross them, and it describes what they went through. We're not going to dwell on that. That's in, that's in Lehi in the desert and so forth. Oh, incidentally, here is a better picture of the, of the Copper Scroll as it was found in Cave 3. Here's a big thing. Remember the idea that the most valuable document must be kept on bronze, and here it is, or brass if you want to call it that. And that's Cave 3Q, and this is Cave 4, where so many things were found. The whole library was found there. Here's one I wanted to show. I stumbled across this yesterday looking through some, some photographs. This was made in room 35 of the of the Cairo Museum, and it stands right next to the Rosetta Stone. Um, it has to be a model of the Rosetta Stone, which is actually in Paris. But here, it's a very interesting thing. Here is a, an inscription in Egyptian here, and here's the same inscription in Greek. And here in the middle is a little strip about five inches wide, and it's the same whole thing in Demotic, showing you how conservative, how short, how, here's the same thing in a darker photograph, some took it. See, this part, the top part, is Egyptian. This, all this bottom part is Greek, the same thing. And this little strip in the middle, that takes care of the whole thing in Demotic. So you see why reformed Egyptian, which came in in, in, the, 20 sec, in the 26th dynasty, became official at that time. It only lasted for a, a short time because it's too hard to learn. But it was the thing in Lehi's day. Everybody was using it. And there it is. And note, note the economy of that. I mean, the, the rather... You have a big book for the rest, and a little strip takes care of that. Quite a thing. Uh, and other things here. Here's the Kara Mountains. We only may have use for them. Let's see what's going on. We've got to move. Because this has to do with our religion, of course, this great and spacious building. We're all partying these days. and We all we want the expensive high-rise and uh, the rest of the things. And the, again, they were drowned. And a great multitude entered into the strange building. That was the popular place. And pointed the finger of scorn, and we did, but we heeded them not. We're in the 33rd verse now. And because of these visions my father had, he was very much troubled about Laman and Lemuel. Well, we have to get on here. And you notice here, he repeats it again. These things did my father see and hear and speak as he dwelt in a tent in the valley of Lemuel. That was their base camp. They've been there a long time now, you see. They don't intend to move until the Lord has a, gives him a dream and tells him to move, rather. But notice 14 times it says in 1 Nephi, my father dwelt in a tent. When my father dwelt in a tent, making it very specific, the style of our life was totally different. Oh, there's a bigger one of this hell that you have to go through. I mean, no rain. No rain for, well, I can up at Thebes. It rains once in 100 years. That's when it's been known to rain. And uh, of course, they have long records of that, and uh, which isn't a very high hmm, precipitation. <laughs> And then he talks about these plates, and account of other plates, and at night he's talking about his summaries in his plates. The Lord hath commanded me to make these plates, and he doesn't know why, but the Lord's commanded him to make them, and he's making these plates to put his record on. There are others, but this is the special one for us. Now the 10th verse, the 10th chapter, and the 12th chapter, and the 13th chapter go together, and they're very important. 
The tenth chapter you notice, uh, it sounds like familiar stuff to begin with. Don't fool yourself. This is the, this puts it all together, and this is, shows it from beginning to end, it's one story. This is the account of the Jews. And the twelfth uh, chapter is the account of the New World version of everything that happened, a summary of what's going to happen in the New World version. And the 13th chapter is the worldwide version, what's going to happen in all the rest of the world. So we first we have the Jews, then we have the people in the New World, including the Gentiles in the New World, and then we have the whole world embraced in this. Because remember this, remember we started with the brass plates as a little tiny speck. Even Lehi, who was a, an important man and a very religious man, didn't own a copy of the Bible. Nobody, it was just this one copy he had to get from Laban, and it was worth stealing to get it. And uh, it all starts out with this little tiny point of light. And it says in this, these plates shall never grow dim again, and they shall finally come, the Old Testament, see, to the entire world. Notice we said it, had the, it was the Tanakh, it had the Torah, and the prophets, and the histories, and the literary writings, they're Ketavim, but why aren't the literary writings there? Why isn't Esther there, and Tobit, and all those writings? Because they're not found in the New Testament it's long after the time of Lehi. They come after Lehi. Joseph Smith is very smart not to get sucked in on that one, wasn't he? No, there's none of that. There's just, just the history she's in, not the literary writing. but lots of poetry and so forth. And uh, Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, and the like. And they're later, and they come from the schools, as far as that goes. Well. Then, so this is what happens to the Jews, this chapter. Notice that. He spake to them concerning, of, uh, concerning the Jews. <laughs> it says in the second verse here. So Lehi puts it all together here. And the Dead Sea Scrolls certainly vindicate the necessity of this indispensable chapter. The, in the beginning, in the beginning and the ending, it's all one history. And this is the theme of chapter 10. As Goldberg said. And it's a grandiose prospect, the same as we find in those other two chapters. And so we go through it. And that... Uh, after they should be destroyed, that was the next step, they should be destroyed, and after that they'd be carried away captive to Babylon, which happened, and they returned, which they did, of course, and possessed again the, la uh, possessed again the land. Then 600 later comes John the Baptist, a prophet raised up among them, even a Messiah. Well, this is Jesus. He talks about the John the Baptist uh, presently, yes. And a prophet, how great a number had testified these concerning the Messiah or this Redeemer. Wherefore, all mankind were in a lost and fallen state, and ever would have, had they not relied on this Redeemer. This is the peculiar situation. I said there was just, just this one point of light. And then the book comes into the possession of Lehi, and just one lone family, just one family is to carry the whole civilization, the whole country, culture, to the new world, where it's to last for a thousand years. Notice the Lord works with very small centers here. And it's the same thing here. What about the rest of the human race? This is the rest of the human race. All mankind were in a lost and fallen state and would be forever if it hadn't relied on the Redeemer. And how few people knew about the Redeemer. Without the atonement, we're not going anywhere and nobody in the world knew about the atonement. And how few people knows about it today, know about it today. Isn't that a strange thing? The first words to Joseph Smith of the Lord when he spoke to him in the grove. Behold, the world at this time lieth in sin after he'd introduced himself, lieth in sin, and there is none that doeth right, no, not one that doeth well, no, not one, and mine anger is kindled against the inhabitants of the earth to visit them according to this ungodliness. Now, that sounds pretty grim, and so it was swept under the rug. We didn't ever, we, did, we found it was 1831. It was older by far than any other account we had of the first vision. It was written down by the dictation of the prophet Joseph by Frederick G. Williams, and it is in the first person. The Lord speaks there in the first person in the version we have later on. Uh, we're told, the Wentworth letter and so forth, we're told, he said, he told me this and he told me that. But this is what he actually said. Why shouldn't we have embraced that? Somebody doesn't like it, I don't know. But the world doesn't like this story and they reject it. And then, then John the Baptist, he, he spoke also of one concerning a prophet who should come before the Messiah to prepare the way of the Lord. That was John the Baptist, to prepare his way, make straight his way in the wilderness and so forth. That was John, who follows the Dead Sea Scrolls condition very closely, as you know. Why is he so important? He is the link, as we, uh, as we read in, in First Luke. Luke begins with two righteous people, both direct descendants of Aaron, Elizabeth and Zechariah, doing their stint in the temple, he has to go a few 
just a few days of the year, do his service. They live in the country. Down in the hills, he comes in to serve, and he goes into the Holy of Holies to, to get things ready, and there he sees an angel. No one had seen an angel in 400 years, and of course he's struck dumb. He's absolutely terrified. And uh, the same angel goes to Mary and so forth. And then he announces that he's going to turn, his son would come and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and so forth, and announces the coming of John the Baptist. He announced the birth of John the Baptist. So the gospel began in the, in the meridian of times with the angel Gabriel introducing himself and coming to John the Baptist. It's good that Gabriel should come to John the Baptist because his work was to baptize and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Hearts were dead, fathers were dead. And then it goes on that they who sat in darkness see a great light. There in the end, there's the chance to work for the dead. And of course, Gabriel is Noah, as Joseph Smith says, and who's better to administer the water works than Noah <laughs> and John the Baptist. They're, they're together in this operation. But these things, the necessity of baptism and its importance is here being emphasized. And he went forth in the wilderness to make straight the paths of the Lord. And this is the link, you see. And my father said he should baptize at Beth Araba. See, he's telling about John the Baptist here. And that he should baptize the Messiah with water. And the gospel should be preached among the Jews then. Concerning the gospel, it should be preached among the Jews. And after they had slain the Messiah who should come, after he had been slain, notice the best people he could come to, his chosen and so forth, they wouldn't accept him at all. So what's the chance? What is the Lord throwing the gospel away on us for? You see, talk about pearls before swine. Nobody wants it. Nobody accepts it. <coughs> nobody understands it. It's a very puzzling thing what's going on here, which should be preached to the Jews, manifest, and it should be made, make him manifest by the Holy Ghost unto the Gentiles. And then he talks about the olive tree in which Jacob, fifth chapter of Jacob goes into detail. See, the olive tree, now the olive, as you know, is the immortal tree. There are olives in Athens and olives in Jerusalem which were growing in the time of Lehi. They're, they're, they live as long as redwoods or anything else because you can't kill it, you know. You cut it off, you prim it down, you cut everything off. See, when there was a raid and the city was destroyed and burned down, the olive would go right on growing again, start growing again. So, of course, it was a miraculous tree of life. It had un unextinguishable life in it. So you'll find these 1,000, 2,000-year-old olive trees in the, well, in the uh, Garden of Gethsemane and so forth but of immense aid because they just keep putting out shoots and growing. And what's more, they can always be grafted. <laughs> of course, we'll come to that when we come to Jacob, if we ever get to Jacob. He talks about that. Uh, we used to live in Rossmoyne in Glendale uh, amidst 800 acres of olives, which uh, my father acquired somehow or other. Uh, but we know all about the olives and the, the marvelous olives you could get up at Sunland and so forth, and the cultivation of the olives and like how they have to be treated. But they're amazing trees, as you know. And this is, this is it. They're, they should be scattered. You can do this to an olive and the quality of olives and so forth. Well, we have a section in that book. Uh, I think it's in the book called uh, Since Camorra. We talk about the olive culture there. The branches of the olive tree or the remnants of the house of Israel should be grafted in. You can graft anything onto an olive tree or come to a knowledge of the true Messiah, their Lord and Redeemer. And after this manner of language, using the olive tree as an image and so forth, I have written many of these things which were expedient in my other book. So if you want to find out about that, I recommend go to the library and ask for Nephi's other book. I was likely to have it as most of the stuff I've recommended, which they do not have anymore, <laughs> including the most important books. They, they disappear. Well. He saw in a vision the things which he spake by the power of the Holy Ghost. You notice here what he's talking about here. Time and place and culture are no object as, experiment, as experience has shown. The gospel is the same whether you introduce it to the Hopis or to the Muslims or the Icelanders or Nigerians or whoever it is. You may have preached to all of those and you'll find the gospel re has the same response in all of them. It's amazing that we don't have to adapt ourselves to their culture at all. Just preach the gospel to them and they embrace it. And they can keep their culture too, as far as that goes. I know devout Muslims who are equally enthusiastic in embracing the gospel. There's no reason why they shouldn't. And uh, this, notice it says here, this gift, this is universal, see, after this. The Messiah, these things, I might, I, Nephi, was desirous also that I might see and hear and know these things by the power of the Holy Ghost, which is the gift of God to all those who diligently seek him, as well in times of old as in time that he should manifest himself unto the children of men. For he is the same today, 
yesterday, today, and forever, and the way is prepared for all men. See, this is universal now. He's not talking about this, the little Jews. He sees it breaking loose and through the Jews and going to all the world. And in Abraham, the same thing here. All those who diligently seek him, remember, that was Abraham's great merit. Remember, the 20, in the second chapter, uh, the uh, 20th verse of the, as it is the 12th verse of the book of Abraham, he says, Thy servant has th sought thee diligently, now he has found thee. But Abraham sought first diligently and then found. The same yesterday, today, and forever, and the way is prepared for all men from the foundation of the world, if it so be that they repent and come unto him. For he that diligently seeketh shall find the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto them. There's making no distinction. He goes right on and says, by the power of the Holy Ghost. The power of the Holy Ghost is, the Holy Ghost is free to minister to anybody who is uh, who makes himself eligible, no matter where you are. In these times as in times of old, as well as in times of old as in times to come, wherefore the course of the Lord is one eternal round. This is a cosmic thing. And then, if you have sought to do wickedly in the days of your probation, this is the, uh, the first mention of the days of probation in the Book of Mormon, which is often mentioned, and it speaks volumes, of course. Then you are found unclean, and you can't possibly dwell with God. The Holy Ghost giveth authority that I should speak these things and deny them not. Now, now the next, you notice the first verse of the next chapter, the 11th, these are the steps by which you solve any problem. Any great problem uh, is solved, uh, any solution, whether it's uh, nuclear power or anything, anything you want to solve. You go about it by these steps, as it says in the first, first verse here. First, you desire to know. Don't you? Remember, they have this... In the Iring building, they have how the TV was invented, the first steps by which you get something. The first and most important step was not asked, though. You never dream of it. The first step they asked, would, would it, is there a demand for it? Will it make a profit? The first step you should ask, will it do more harm than good? You see, this is the thing. But how can you know? Well, anyway, but it came to pass that after I desired to know these things, first you have to desire to know. Then you have to believe that it can be done. People gave up on the atom because they didn't know it could be split. But once somebody had done it, once Rutherford had done it, Rutherford, uh, he was with the theory, once it had been done, that was half the problem. At least half the difficulty had been overcome. Then everybody jumped on the problem because they knew there was a solution. That had been the hardest, that was the greatest obstacle. And it had never been done, it was theoretical, and probably could never be done. But as soon as it was done, the biggest part of the problem. So if you believe it can be solved, that's the most important step. That the Lord is able to make known to me. And then what do you do? Then you sit pondering. You size the problem up from various situations. You research, you do everything you can, you sit pondering. Uh, and if you keep pondering, suddenly, this is the only way you'll get it, you can't ponder it in existence, but suddenly you'll have a flash of insight. Suddenly you'll get the bright idea. Uh, it's a Something which every great inventor, every great scientist says, over which you have no control, it just comes to you as a flash. After you've been working on the problem, maybe for years, then it comes. So this is the way it comes to Nephi here. For if you desire, then you're sure it can be done. The Lord can do it. And then you work it out in your own mind. See, pondering in mine heart. Then you're caught away in the spirit to an exceeding high mountain. Here's the solution. Now the exceeding high mountain, of course, we think of all kinds of high mountains of Revelation, the Mountain of Transfiguration, the Mount of Olives, uh, the ancient ziggurat, that's all it was, where the king went up to make contact with heaven, the pyramid, the same thing in Egypt, it was a, the, the Holy Mount, the Mountain of the Lord's House in the Bible, the temple is on the Mountain of the Lord's House, the Acropolis, the capital, the highest place. You go up the top of a mountain because where people don't go there, it's of, a, of an exceedingly high mountain, the Mountain of the Transfiguration being the most notable, because it was high, nobody ever went up there. You're removed and aloof from the world, you're by yourself, and so forth. That's the place to have it. And this is an exceedingly high mountain he'd never seen before, so he's caught out here. What we're do talking here is about another dimension. Remember, when you have vision like here, in another dimension, all you can do is describe it. And he says that this is going to be largely just metaphors to try to make you realize the sort of thing he's talking about. <laughs> Notice he says, in which I had never set my foot. Well, now, is it real or isn't it? The Spirit said to me, what desires there? And I said, I desire to behold the things my Father said. And then the next step, well, do you, do you believe it? Yes, I believe it. Then the Spirit cries with a loud voice, saying, Hosanna. And so this is, this is the exciting, uh, most exciting experience anyone can have when suddenly there is a breakthrough, and this is it. The voice Spirit cried, well, we've got somebody qualified here, Hosanna, three cheers, uh, the Most High God, and you shall behold it. 
to believe it and you're qualified and this is the answer thou shalt behold the things which thou hast desired in the sixth verse and behold I'm giving you this he says for a sign and what he sees is behold a man and you shall bear record that it is the son of God and then he says look and he looks and he sees a tree he sees now he's being shown things he sees a tree exceeding beauty the whiteness thereof did exceed the whiteness of driven snow now there's whiteness throughout the book of Mormon we'll see it right in the same chapter here and he asked the spirit, notice this is another dimension, you'd think it would be, the, the fruit would be at least orange or, or pink or rosy or some tempting color. Nobody wants to eat snow white fruit. And he said to me, what desirest thou, he said. And he, as he spoke to me, he was in the form of a man, yet nevertheless I knew it was the spirit of the Lord. Now we're using some sort of double talk. I say, we are in another dimension. A form of a man, yet I knew it was the spirit of the Lord. And he spoke to me, as a man speaketh with another. And he says, look, and he beholds a virgin. She was exceeding fair and white. What are the use white? Well, I just went to a dictionary to consult white. I could think of a lot of them, but they, they think of a lot more here. Arabic, the expression, uh, may God show him favor. What means, uh, may God cheer him, may God show him favor. Literally, it says, uh, may God whiten his countenance. May God whiten his face. And another one, he is bayad al-wadzhi. He is white of countenance, white of face, which simply means he is of good character. He's a good person. Because in the Book of Mormon, it says, it says that Nephites were white and delightsome, and the others were dark and loathsome, and so forth. It means white in this sense, <coughs> in the sense of, of good character. But it's the regular word for white, abidu and ahmaru, aswadu. Bayad al And who, who is uh, bayadatu abelidi? You ask for the Bayadatu, who is the white man of the place? That means the foremost man, the most respected man. If he's white, he's most respected. And what are Alayam el Baidi? Days of whiteness. They're happy days, days of prosperity. I guess it, it would be the Bialinochi in Moscow, the white nights. And then, here's an interesting thing here is uh, uh, Ayadu Baida'ahu. The uh, Baida'u, that's the regular feminine of the. See, uh, colors are always a defective form. And Abedai means, uh, means with a white hand. He has a white hand, a white hand. It means the white hand, which means beneficence, power, favor, merit, glory. A white hand is merit or glory, anything white, you see. And there are two races of men. The human race is divided into uh, al-Sudanu and al-Baidanu. The Sudanu are the black ones, and the Baidanu are the white ones. Well, that wouldn't be natural in a culture where people are either outdoors or indoors. You know, in Greek uh, paintings, of which we have thousands of ages, all the men being outdoors are always painted a dark bronze, and all the women staying indoors and keeping white lead on their faces are always white. It's, it's a cultural thing, <laughs> the members of the same race. So we get this idea of the contrast of the good guys and the bad guys, and so it's called black and white. Uh, this has to do with race and book. It's important. We use this white business, you see. And, the, uh, and here's a regular word for a woman is baitatul hijri. A hijr is a curtain indoors, the apartment for women. A person, a woman, is one who does not go outdoors and get in the hot sun, that's all. But the regular word for woman is badal, uh, badal uh, hidr. A hidr, as I say, it's the veil, it's the harem, it's the inner part of a house, it can be the kitchen or anything else, it's just not going outdoors. There's the two cultures, you see. Uh, but it's a cultural thing whether you're black or white. The whole thing, cultural, moral, and everything else. But that's the universal word, black and white, to use for good and bad and everything else. And so, we go merrily on our way here. This virgin was exceeding fair and white. It, it doesn't mean she was leprous or anything like that. Of course not. This is the expression it's using. Fair and white, they would go together. And then I said to him, I said, he sees a virgin most beautiful and fair above all other virgins. Again, you see the other dimensions. This is the mother of the Son of God after the manner of the flesh. Now, that Son of God has been inserted in the original text. We used to use in this class the uh, Wilford Woods uh, printing of the first edition of the Book of Mormon. So everybody had first edition, and it was more helpful with this. The reason you got rid of it, it doesn't, it's not divided into the same chapters, it's not divided into verses, so it's very hard to locate things in. Just a straight story, but it reads much better that way. That's the way, that's the way, and you can get it still. You can get the copy, it's called Joseph Smith Begins His Work, Volume 1, the Wilford Wood series. And, uh, it didn't say Mother of Son of God, it said Mother of God. And of course, throughout the Book of Mormon, Jesus Christ is God, He is the Lord, He is the Creator, and so forth. 
it would be a quibble about this sort of thing. And when he comes down to earth, you see he still has his status, but he is born and had another. It's not the same thing this meant that became the, the subject of a, a great controversy between uh, the sex of the, uh, of the Eastern and the Western churches. Eastern church, should we use that expression, mother of God, or shouldn't we use it, you see? Because the idea that God could have a mother is very offensive when you consider that God is like nothing you can possibly imagine. But God for us is not like nothing you can possibly imagine. Well, he's been carried away in the spirit, you'll notice, he says in the next verse, which means, which means that he is in this other dimension. And the angel said to me, Behold the Lamb of God. Well, of course, it wasn't a real lamb. Do you know the meaning of the tree which thy father saw? Notice, do you know the meaning? It's an allegory. It wasn't a real tree, but was it a real tree? No. It is the love of God, which sheddeth itself abroad in the hearts of men. That's what we have in this picture, see. The, the person striking the lyre to bring harmony to all nature with the animals and the, uh, and the birds, all sh showering its favor above the altar in the temple here. Didn't have the altar then, didn't have a temple. They had the scroll of the law there. And yet, yes, this is what the meaning of the tree is. It is the lo love of God. And wherefore, it is the most desir desirable of, of all other, other things. Uh, that's why the fruit is so desirable, is the love of God. But then he goes down and tells us the waters also represent the love of God. Down here in the 25th verse here. <laughs> Which waters are representation of the love of God. Again, another allegory, you see. Now, behold the condescension of God. Now, remember, the world is absolutely out of it. Nobody accepts this. Nobody understands it. What a strange thing to work in a vacuum like that. What's going on, one begins to ask. That's what we have the Book of Mormon for. Behold the condescension of God to work with such people. And I beheld the Redeemer of the world, whom my father had spoken, also beheld the prophet John, who's prepared the way for him. And... I also beheld twelve others followed him. Well, in First Nephi, Lehi had that dream too. You remember his first vision there, the ascension, the ninth verse. He saw the angels <laughs> descending to minister to men, and behold, the Lamb of God going forth among the children of men he did. And what happened to him? At last he visits the children of men, and he is completely rejected. He can't get anywhere, notice. Remember, even the apostles all fled and left him at this time, the 32nd verse. He was taken by the people, yea, the Son of the everlasting God was judged of the world, and I saw and bear record. It happened, yes. If his own people did this, he would have wasted on the rest of the human world. Therefore, an, that's why an absolute atonement is necessary with no strings attached. Because if anybody could be disqualified for atonement for any reason, we'd all be out in the cold. You, see, you can't do it. The atonement is absolute. It covers everything, even whether you want it or not. Okay, but that happens. And then, uh, again, we'll get to that later. So he's taken by, and put, he's lifted up on the cross, and the multitudes of the earth were gathered together against the apostles. They were wiped out. And I beheld, they were in the large and spacious building. Behold, the world and the wisdom thereof, that's what the building stands for. Yea, the house of Israel hath gathered together to fight against the twelve. Who has gathered together to fight against the twelve apostles? The house of Israel, of all things. And that great and spacious building, 36 verse, was the pride of the world. It fell, and the fall thereof was exceeding great. And the angel of the Lord spake unto me again, saying, Thus shall the destruction of all nations, kindreds, and tongues, and people that shall fight against the twelve apostles of the land. Now I must tell you about the, oh, it's time, the castle of Gumdan. There's a great epic, the Arabs, way back in the early days, in the beginnings of the world, in the early times, there was a great castle, and it was high above the earth, and it was full of vanity and full of people. And it fell, they still show the ruins, it fell, and uh, great was the fall. That was the great castle of Gumdan. So it becomes legendary. It is the house representing the vanity of the world. And it fell and was destroyed completely. And there have been such. In Jericho, the Dajani family owns the, the castle, uh, the, uh, the palace that was prepared by a, uh, what was his name? Oh, darn. Uh, and uh, he put, it took 27 years to build. It was going to be the most gorgeous castle ever built, the most gorgeous palace ever built. The ruins are still there. They won't take you to see them or something, but Ani Dajani and his brother, they're the head, they're the cousins of the king, Hussein, incidentally, and they're the head of the archaeology and antiquities in, in Jordan. They were until they were both assassinated. That's the kind of people we have over there. And uh, that's what goes on. Uh, the last telling, that's what happened. But going to that castle is a... a, a Going to going to the uh, the ruin there, it's it's down in the, it's very extensive. But you never saw such elegance. I mean, they had everything. They had the tepidarium and the color, and they had the the frigidarium. They had the 
hot and cold and normal baths right next to a, a sumptuous banquet room where they had, and then they had booths for everybody. They even had special booths for, for the, the guards at the gate to meet their lady friends and so forth. Everything was taken care of, the most sumptuous palace imaginable. He spent 27 years building it. And the night it was finished, this is the thing, the night it was finished, he was going to have a grand dedication. The uh, lights were all lit and so forth, and there was an earthquake that completely demolished it that night. At the same time, uh, I don't think of his name in a while, he had a heart attack and died the same night. After 27 years, this is what happened, you see, of getting ready for this, this grand palace. And so this is Gumdan, the vanity of man, and what happens to the vanity of man. And this, this becomes a, a lesson, of course. This is, really happens. The ruin is there, and it's this, an astonishing ruin. I mean, what they, the luxury of that place. But it was wiped right out uh, <laughs> for its dedication, just like the Titanic. Well, Titanic's another model of the same thing, isn't it? Here was the vanity of the world, the greatest ship in the world, the unsinkable ship. Richest people in the world are on it. There were, there were the richest people in the world. There were uh, Vanderbilts were on it, weren't they? And some others. Uh, yeah. And down they went. And that became over. That sobered up the whole Western world. We're still sober when we think of what happened in April 1912. So he's talking about that here and the vanity of the world and what happens. Well, then we... I see the time is up now. At this rate, we're not going to finish the Book of Mormon this semester. But these things have a point. The Lord is putting them in there for us, and they become more significant all the time. Along with this nice little running commentary that we get throughout the Book of Mormon that gives us enough hints, enough footnotes, enough points of evidence that we can check on it. It isn't just as if somebody sat down and decided to make up a moral story. You try doing that yourself and you won't get anywhere. Nobody will. It just doesn't happen that way. And nobody would recognize the Book of Mormon. There's only one way to keep from recognizing, that's don't read it. And I know a lot of people that succeed that way. <laughs> yes, I notice. Fawn Brody, who wrote the, the classic against Joseph Smith, never read the Book of Mormon. No, she never read it. Her copy of the Book of Mormon is up and so on. She has about two comments in it, and they say Indians in the, in the margin. But no, when she says that the, that the Leohona was uh, an arrow spinning inside a crystal and things like that, she hasn't read it.